You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You gotta make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in this here call in show, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608 501 0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. And once again, we got ourselves a new caller. New caller, what's going down? Hey, Ryan, this is Zach N. from Marshfield, Wisconsin. Hey. Hey, I'm just letting you know that I love the podcast, and I always have loved the podcast for a long time. And today I've racked up the courage to call in, and I'm sick of all the drama. I want to talk about football. Football hey, is what started this podcast. And the Packers, this is... You know what, I'll say it. This is our year. Okay. This is our year. You know what? We don't, you know, we might not make the Super Bowl, but God damn it, we're going to be a goddamn good team this year. It is. Watson, Dobbs, Love. You know, we'll make, you know, I'd say we'll be an even team. You know what? I'll even say we'll better. Well, what? 11 wins this year. There you go. Tell me why we're going to win 11 wins this year. All right. I think it's wide receiver crew. Nobody talks about the wide receiver crew. You could do it, I guess. It's going to be good. Everybody's sleeping on it. Yeah. Love, it's going to be good. I think he's going to be great. Um, everybody thinks, everybody thinks, I don't even have to say it. individuals, everybody thinks it's going to be terrible. I think everybody's going to be good this year. Uh, tell me reasons why it would prove me wrong. I really don't think anybody's going to prove me wrong. We brought everybody in that phew, we're going to be bad. No, no chance. Um, offensive line, exact same. Yep. Wide receivers, Jane Reed Boom. makes us even better. Yep. Distraction is the big is the big reason this offense is going to be good this year. Um, tight end makes us much better. Wide receiver options. Um, if you can give me a reason why we're going to be worse this year, I don't think so. Jordan Love, we've all seen it. He looks much better. Um, if you can give us a reason why we might look worse, let us know. If not, tell us why we're even better. Thank you very much. First time caller, first time caller. I already <laughs> said that. Oh, well. It's Bye-bye. Oh, good, dude. Uh, yeah. So you asked for two different things, and strangely enough, I can do both, multi-talented and whatnot. You asked me to tell you why you're going to get 11 wins and also why we're going to be bad this year. Well, I, I guess in a sense I can't do either. I can't definitively tell you, but I can give you some, some, you know, some thoughts on the issue. By the way, thanks for calling. Appreciate it. But yeah, it's it's like I talked about. I think yesterday. Um, it's there. There is a range for every team. There's a range. There's there's a uh, you know 
in some universe, this is technically possible range, which for all teams could be, you know, like first overall pick to Super Bowl. But then there's a more realistic range. And I'm of the opinion the Packers have a bigger range than most teams. I think a lot of teams, because we have a lot of data on the the given players, and each of those players have kind of a range, right? I mean, uh, Justin Herbert, what is he at his best? What is he at his worst? Assuming health, right? Because of course, injuries can change things pretty dramatically for all teams. But unknowns have a bigger range. And one of those unknowns is a quarterback. That really dramatically changes things. And that's true not only of Jordan Love, but of rookie quarterbacks. But I would say it's even more so of Jordan Love. Because when I look at especially this rookie class, which coming in, you're thinking, eh, I don't know, they're, they're kind of iffy to me. Plus, it's their first year. So even if, you know, Anthony Richardson ends up being like one of the all-time greats, and of course, he has an unbelievably high ceiling. It probably, probably isn't this year, especially on that garbage team. Probably. Maybe he can pull off a Justin Fields and at least run for 600,000 yards, but, you know, needs to work on his passing a little bit, which honestly is exactly what I thought of him when I watched him. The passing was a little bit iffy, but this dude is a absolute freak show of an athlete, and if he can learn to throw better, then he's going to be unstoppable. But for Love, there's more reason to believe that he could step in immediately because, again, this is year four for him, I think. I don't know. I can't keep this stuff straight. Yeah, year four. I mean, 2020 was a little bit iffy with COVID and whatnot, but still, it's year four. Then you look at, again. I mean, we've done this a thousand times, but you look at the wide receivers. I mean, at its best, let's say Jordan Love, not not only because I've, I've, I've been even tempering ex- expectations and saying if he can just be kind of good, you know, like the 12th, 11th, 10th best quarterback, which sounds like high praise, but it's not because borderline 50% of the quarterbacks in the NFL are just pretty bad. So I'm asking him to just kind of escape that, you know, be kind of middle of the pack amongst the quarterbacks that are at least competent. But it's entirely possible the dude's just good at football, which seems to be a possibility that escapes everybody. And then, yeah, you look at the wide receivers. I mean, Christian Watson, dude, as a rookie, what he did last year is really impressive, especially considering he didn't play a ton. He was out with injuries. He was recovering from a surgery in the offseason. So, you know, his quarterback isn't there. And then he's not there when the quarterback's there because he's recovering from injuries. So they had no time to work together. Then they had the one shot play early and he dropped it and they just didn't really go to him again because they wanted to rely on Lazard and Cobb for some reason because they understand the offense. So uh, Watson got used as a decoy, which could be Aaron Rodgers as much as Matt LaFleur that's responsible for that. Whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is he was not a focal point of the offense until midseason. And he still was able to do the amount of damage that he did. And I think he is just an absolute freak. I think Romeo Dobbs is going to be better. I mean, these guys are all going into year two. That's a big deal. This isn't like year five or year six where you're like, oh, I wonder if they're going to start regressing. Or even like Justin Jefferson where it's like, I mean, he, he, he peaked as a rookie. You know, <laughs> like the, you, you can't really physically get better than that. And even if you do, which same with, with um, Devontae when he kind of reached his peak, but then slowly got a little bit better for the next, like, two to three years. But it's still just the same guy. I mean, we're, we're, we're dancing around margins here. And then the tight ends. I mean, my goodness. Again, we had a lot of experience before, but we've never had the receiving potential of a tight end group clearly since Finley. And you know my opinion of Finley. He never reached his full potential. This could easily be significantly better than what we had with Finley, especially when you combine the two guys together and understand that we've never had an athlete. Almost nobody in NFL history has had an athlete like Musgrave at tight end, considering, you know, athleticism has grown over the years. Musgrave would have been, I mean, more, more athletic than most wide receivers not very long ago and be for, for probably most of NFL history, on top of being bigger. Then you add in Tucker Kraft, who, you know, a big, physical, strong. Uh, Jaden Reed, who really is an impressive route runner and doesn't have to come in and be sort of that X. You know, I mean, if it was a different situation, if if we didn't have guys, you know, if, if this was, let's just say, um, last year and we only drafted Jaden Reed, so it's Lazard and Cobb and Jaden Reed, and it's like Jaden needs to be that X receiver, it would be a little bit more concerning. But you could see it. You could look at him and be like, I could, you know, I can see him getting there. He's a super talented guy, I think, maybe, you know, in, in, in time. But he doesn't have to be. He's got to be one of three with two pretty established guys. And you know you got the running backs. You know you got a good offensive line. They're healthier than they've ever been. We've got younger, faster, bigger, stronger at the receiving groups than we've ever been. 
Aaron Jones, really there's no reason to believe that he necessarily has to fall off. He is kind of over the hill in terms of his age, but you look at his snap count, he might as well be 26 years old. It's one of the benefits of McCarthy and LaFleur putting almost no tread on the guy's tires. And again, the, the defense played about as bad as you could expect them to play. And, and so just regression to the mean based on the talent that we have, I would expect them to be better. I'm not saying top five. I'm just saying better than the bottom of the barrel they were. And then again, when you look at how, um, well, the two re- so three reasons. Regression to the mean, number one. Number two, Joe Barry figuring out something at the end of the season, finally. Number three, Rashawn Gary. Now, I don't know that he comes back week one, but it's entirely possible that he can. It's kind of on the early end of the spectrum in terms of when somebody can recover from, you know, an, a, an ACL injury. But you also got to understand this is Rashawn Gary. He is a physical freak and he works harder than anybody. So if anybody can do it, it's Rashawn Gary. But either way, he is a massive key piece of this defense. Oh, by the way, one of the key reasons our defense fell apart was the edges. So what do we do? We go out and get three guys, including our first pick, who is Lucas Van Ness, who is an absolute freak show. So there's every reason to believe, again, pending health, that with Preston Smith and Rashawn Gary and Lucas Van Ness, and the two other young guys that are in there that are you know probably going to be rotating in and out, but it doesn't matter. The pass rush should get better, on top of Wyatt taking a bigger role. And I don't know necessarily that he's going to be better, but considering how everybody on along the defensive line completely bottomed out last year, it's hard to imagine that he could be any worse. Fortunately for us, he is one of the biggest athletic freaks on this team, which is saying a lot considering we have guys like Lucas Musgrave and Christian Watson and uh, Rashawn Gary who just break the mold. So that's the positive side of things. There's every reason to be excited. On the negative side of things, if our defense is what it was last year, and our offense being as young as it is can't quite get on the same page, and Jordan Love just isn't very good, we're going to suck, like bad. I mean, to to put it into perspective, last year there was every reason to believe that we were going to be a force to be reckoned with. Devontae left, that kind of sucked, but Aaron Rodgers is coming off of back-to-back MVPs, We stocked up on three new wide receivers. We still had Lazard, and we still had Cobb, and we still had the running backs, and we still had the offensive line, and everybody thought we were going to have a top five defense. I shouldn't say everybody, but I mean, when when the national media is finally starting to come around to the Packers' defense, you start to feel like something special is going on. And look how bad that was. There's more reason to be skeptical about this year than there was last year when we bottomed out. So I don't know, man. But I appreciate the optimism because, again, you can you can. You get to just choose, you know, because we don't know. So you can choose to be pessimistic or you could choose to be optimistic, but I find it more fun to be excited about the potential. I mean, that that's, that's, that's the fun of the off season. Everybody's great. Everybody got better. That's why Bears fans are so loud in the off season. Because in the regular season, they're hiding under a rock, just throwing temper tantrums while I blast my laughing at the enemy episodes. So join in on the nonsense party that everybody else is having which is that we got so much better, we're so much stronger, haha, we're going to kill everybody. Why not? It's stupid, but it's fun. I mean, if you're that scared about receipts, just call into the show and say it. Nobody knows who you are. They're not going to pull up your receipt from the show. Or just do it in private. Just sit there in your, in your lounge chair with your feet up, watching TV, and then when a commercial comes on, you just look up at the, look up at the ceiling and say, we're going to be so good this year, man. You know? It's more fun. Anyways, thanks again for the call, man. I appreciate it. All right, back to the top we go with Steve in Alaska. Hey, Ryan, Steve up in Alaska. How's it going, man? Good. Um, just got done listening to you uh, talk about the Colin Coward <laughs> episode and and stupid, ridiculous stuff that he spews out of his mouth. And I'd like to say thank you. Congratulations, bud. Finally coming over to our side. You, you had a terrible habit of, of defending him. <laughs> To, to a degree, not usually, but to a degree. When I don't know, maybe because I, I don't really watch those shows. Maybe there was just a couple times when I watched him, and it was just, you know, I mean, the the way he approaches things tends to at least sound like it's more data driven as opposed to whatever. And he does do those shows where he talks to the um, the the betting people, and that's when he like puts on his really smart hat as opposed to. But yeah, he he's he's maybe he's just getting worse. I don't know. I'm not sure, but. The few times I saw him, I was like, thank you. Finally, somebody that actually makes sense. But I, I don't know, man. It's it's getting bad. I mean, he's a complete moron. Yeah. And he's a, he, he, he's a total elitist. All right? That's true. He, he 
He plays up to, to four major media markets. He plays up to the Dallas market. He plays up to the New York market. He plays up to the L.A. market and the Chicago market. The Chicago market, if, you know, I've listened to his show because, again, I'm a dissenter and I like hearing the other side so I can have, you know, a grasp of how stupid they're being. But his wife's from Chicago. His wife's family's from Chicago. So he defends Chicago as much as he can for as crappy as they've been and as crappy as they are. And part of that defense is attacking us. Because it sounds good to the Chicago market to hear how much he thinks we suck. Yeah. There's a whole scene there. The guy does this all the time. He's got a, a segment that he does on Mondays uh, where it's, we're, we're calling his right and we're calling his wrong. And what he's going to talk about. And he gets to cherry pick when he's right. And if you ever listen to it, the whole thing is just a joke. Because he doesn't ever go back on that wrong stuff. <laughs> he doesn't really ever amend it. He he says it, and it's like a retraction article in the newspaper that ends up somewhere on page 36 at the very back in small print. Yeah, we made a mistake. Here's what it really is. But we'll never talk about it again because, you know, we didn't want to admit that we're wrong or actually idiots. You know, most of the statements that he makes are these big, broad generalizations where it could be a lot of different things, and he has a real habit of repeating a useless piece of information over and over like the oh five articles five articles well these five articles and he just works to implant it into people that know the morons and plant it into their head that those five articles are like the only five articles yeah and they don't even look at the articles they just know Colin said five articles so thank you for finally completely coming over I hope you stay over on this side because <laughs> the guy is the guy is just a tool um, on another note because I got thirty seconds left um, something that, that I think you'd be interested in hearing about. I created a new sandwich at my barbecue stand. Ooh. Uh, it, I will tell you the order that I make it so you get the idea of what yep. it is. Let's do it. It's, uh, mayonnaise, barbecue sauce, uh, cheddar cheese, Oof. got four slices of bacon, four slices of smoked pork tenderloin, oh. pulled pork, uh, more barbecue sauce, oh. red onions, and pickles. It yeah. weighs about a pound and a third. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a huge sandwich. Yeah, dude. <laughs> All right, bud. I don't think you got any of this, but we'll talk to you later. Bye. Yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the uh, those vegetables off of my sandwich personally because I'm I'm just looking for the heart attack. I'm not trying to abate that in any way, but that sounds amazing, dude. It really does. I actually um, I've got a so my pork loin I'm almost do- done with. So you know a, a normal person they would cook like portions of a pork loin and then just you know eat that. And I should because then I could grill more if I would just do like. But no, I got to cook the whole freaking thing at once and then just eat it over the next like week. So I've been eating nothing. And I'm, I, believe me, I'm not complaining about it. I've had pork loin tacos. I've had pork pork chop sandwiches. And I'll, sometimes I'll just take hunks of pork and just eat it. And I've got all my different sauces. So it's like it's like eating something different every time. I, it's delicious. But anyways, that that's the one problem with it. But as that's dwindling down, and this takes forever to thaw. It's been thawing for some time now. But I got a pork butt sitting in the fridge. I haven't attacked one in a while. I've never been fully happy with the way that they've come out. I mean, they're 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 fine, and maybe maybe this is what you're shooting for. But you know, the the, the interior of the pork just it just doesn't have a ton of flavor. So I've done a lot of different things to it. A lot of times, what I'll do is I'll pull it and then I'll season it, and then I'll even put it back on the the smoker so that you can kind of smoke all the meat. That's been okay. But anyways, I'm I'm gonna attack it again. I'm gonna try to do it as traditionally as I possibly can, and this time. For the first time, and I've never done it before, I bought an injector, eight bucks on Amazon, got a cheap one, probably going to break after one use, but that's fine. I probably won't do this again. And then I got some uh, injection marinade coming. It's got some of that phosphate in it, which I just learned about butcher barbecue or something, I think. So anyways, I'm going to inject up that pork butt. I'm going to use the, uh, I think I'm going to try the Weber. The Weber makes me nervous because you really got to, it's going to run out of fuel. But I think I'm actually going to only do probably the, the six hours, see if I can do, you know, however long it takes. But just just roughly six, if I can keep that thing rolling that long. And then I'll probably pull it, wrap it, and put it in the oven, which I know sounds like blasphemy, but BTUs are BTUs, you know what I mean? It's not taking on smoke and foil. So I'll finish it in the oven, and then I'm just going to let it, I'm going to hold it as long as I possibly can. Um, I don't know if I'll hold it in the oven. I'm contemplating holding it in the sous vide. Because you can hold it in there as long as you want. I'm just worried because nobody really does that, even though it seems like a perfect thing. I'm just worried there's some kind of a scientific thing that's going to mess it up, you know, being in a bag or something. I don't don't know. But it would be nice to, you know, maybe I'll let it sit out for a while to bring the temperature down before I shock it in, you know, 140 degree water bath or 150 or whatever. Let it kind of come down naturally wrapped and then... um, 
either that or the oven. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't really like the idea of having my oven on like overnight, <laughs> just letting that thing sit in there. I don't know. I mean, I know you can turn it off, but it goes down to like 170 anyways. So, but anyways, yeah, that's next on my list and that's going to be a whole bunch of goodness. But yeah, as far as, uh, Colin Coward goes, you know, the, the funny thing is too, that the anybody can make a good point and anybody can make a bad point. So one of the things that I always do, which I'm sure some people are rolling their eyes at, but I'll, I'll, for example, call out Colin Coward for being the biggest idiot ever. And then, you know, a week later, like, check out this segment by Colin Coward. It's really smart. And it's like, well, how, how can that be? Listen, these people are just vessels for ideas. And if the ideas are stupid, I'm going to smack the idea and then I'm going to smack the guy that, that proposed it. But if they say something that I think is a good point and they and they raise it, I'm going to mention it and I'm going to give them credit for it. Because look, just because somebody said something dumb doesn't mean that every single word that comes out of their mouth has to be false, right? Well, Colin Coward said it, so I guess well, now he says the package going to be good. They must be bad. That's not the way that that works. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to keep listening to what people say. If I agree with it, I'm going to play it. I'm going to say, here's what they said, and I think it's a great point. And if they don't, then I'm just going to say that they're idiots. But um, I, I do think about that sometimes, and I'm like, check out this segment. I think this is a good point for these, this, that, that reason. It's like, dude, you've you've carved this guy up so many times, you're being a hypocrite. No, I'm not being a hypocrite. It's the wrong word. It's only a hypocrite if I'm if I'm using him as an authority figure and saying, here's what this person said, and we should believe it because of what they said. No, I don't give a crap about the person. I give a crap about the idea that's being espoused. I don't argue from authority because I think that's stupid. I don't give a crap who you are or where you've been or what you've done. I mean, I, I might care, depending on the situation, but for the most part, I think that's lazy and boring. Ideas are what matter. So anyways, that thing that he espoused was dumb. But it's, it's also interesting what you brought up about the markets, and I guess I haven't put a ton of thought into that. I know I've, I've heard the term like East Coast bias or whatever, or maybe they call it West Coast bias it, as, a, as an anti-bias, I don't know. But the media is always, you know drumming up New York stuff, which most people don't care about, especially when Buffalo is bad. It's like, there's not a good team out there. It's three teams, they all suck. Giants once in a while were good, but I just always thought they're all from New York, so that's why they drum up New York, and they couldn't give a crap about the West Coast because, I don't know, it's far away or something. I don't, I don't know. But it actually does make sense. You know, you think about, for example, political news shows, which, you know, the, the ones that all pretend that they're unbiased, but every single one of them obviously is completely biased. What do they do? They appeal to the base of their, their viewership. I mean, that's what everybody does. Who's watching us and what do they want to hear? Let's give it to them. It's what every smart person does except me. <laughs> Once in a while, I ask what you guys want to hear. Not that I do it, but I'm just curious what you want to hear. But it would make sense if, you know, you're a major television show and you got a ton of analytics on where all this stuff is coming from, and you're realizing that, you know, 70% of your listener base is coming from five different cities or regions. And so, yeah, you would want to appeal to them. For example, um, when I... YouTube would be a good example of this because I, I get feedback, first of all, in the comments, but also feedback from when I do videos. So when I first started my YouTube channel, the entire point, which I'm still mad at myself for not continuing it because it was really taking off and then I just didn't want to do it anymore and it was before everybody else was doing it, but it was just a NFL draft thing. It was just mock drafts. That's all it was. And it was doing quite well, but um, you could just tell based on how many people watched it, who cared, right? So for example, surprisingly, a lot of people like the Cleveland Browns stuff. Why? Because, well, the Cleveland Browns were terrible and the draft was the only thing they had to look forward to. So as a as a culture, as a group, they've learned to appreciate the draft because it was more exciting than anything else. Dallas Cowboys, always huge. Anything Dallas Cowboys ends up huge. They've got a huge fan base, tons of people on YouTube. They're, they're uh, you know, the, the YouTubers are massive. The podcasts are huge. It's just a massive market that can handle a lot of stuff. So... If you wanted to um, do something on YouTube, you, you would be better served to praise the Dallas Cowboys. Because not only are Dallas Cowboys fans going to subscribe to your YouTube channel, and they're going to come in and, and uh, probably watch more. I mean, they might come in to, to rage at you or whatever. But, but on top of that, the comment sections are going to look better. It's just going to look better if you're, if you're in the comments and they're positive. You know, you get more thumbs up than thumbs down. And who knows, maybe that is the reason for, 
you know, everybody praising the Chicago Bears and talking about how great they're going to be, and man, they're really going to turn around, and Justin Fields is going to be great. Maybe none of these guys actually believe it. The reason they're saying it is because it's in Chicago, and that's what Bears fans want to hear, and there's more Bears fans than Packer fans. So yeah, they're going to say Jordan Love sucks, and Justin Fields is going to be great, not because of anything rational, but because you're going to get more positive viewer feedback than more people watching if you appeal to the biggest market. And it's, it's, it's even better to trash the Packers because the Packers, although I, I, I can't imagine it's the smallest market because the fan base is nationwide quite large, but the data probably doesn't reflect that because they can't see, hey, you know, among that group in, for example, Texas that's watching, they're not all Dallas Cowboys fans and you can't see in the analytics where they are. So you just see regions. So they might be reading the data completely wrong you know when you look at how many people from wisconsin watched well it's significantly less than you know the the minneapolis market the chicago market maybe even you know detroit and 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 uh you know michigan so they're like dude if we if we bash the packers we get minneapolis we get chicago and we get detroit all excited about it so just go to these regions and bash on the the smallest market team Again, probably stupid in the case of the Packers because it is a smaller local regional market, but it is one of the bigger fan bases that spreads nationwide and um, and worldwide. Makes sense to me. Anyways, we're only two callers in, but why don't we take a break? I'm very long-winded today. I apologize. Not supposed to be about me. We'll take a break, and I will be a better person on the other side of the break. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, (laughs) That's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. Taste the Mediterranean through March 19th at Whole Foods Market. Save on Animal Welfare Certified Bone-In Beef Short Ribs, Sustainable Wild-Caught Sockeye Salmon, and more. Find sales on Parmigiano-Reggiano, Charcuterie and Ground Lamb. Grab an Olive Bull Bread from the Bakery. Plus, wines from the Mediterranean start at just $8.99. Taste the Mediterranean now at Whole Foods Market. Must be 21+. plus. Please drink responsibly. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo Concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Hello. Hey, Ryan. Hey, there Eric. Is. Uh, just listened to your rant about uh, Colin uh, Calford. Yeah. And, uh, dude, you are the king of rants. Thank you. That was epic. That is one of the things that got me listening to you was how epic your rants are. Colin, all I can say is that guy, someone's blown out his pilot light. <laughs> um... He's playing hockey with a warm puck. Hey, there it is. Got another He's one? got some major splinters in his mind. <laughs> I I just don't get it. This guy is intellectually lazy. He embodies what I hate about ESPN right now. These people don't have a clue. They don't put any effort into having an intellectual opinion anymore. It is mind-numbing how stupid that take was. I hope Green Bay completely proves people like him wrong. Um, it, it, it just stupefies me and makes me hate the the East Coast 
media and the West Coast media even more when they belittle flyover country. I, I just, oh man, throw punch wouldn't do him justice. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm just speechless. I'm out. Yeah, and it, it's it's as far as the flyover country thing, the reason it's so stupid and obnoxious is that it's unearned superiority. You didn't do anything, but you think by virtue of living somewhere that makes you better, right? Even if you're right about, let's say, the regions. Let's say, you know, there's there's more wealth, there's more intellect, there's more uh, culture, there's better everything. Fine. That has nothing to do with you. This is This is where it's stupid, where people, like, leave the Midwest and go to like New York or something because they, they just, they have this internal um, dislike of, of this backwards Midwest and all this. And you go out there because you want to be something better. You're not better. There's nothing about you that's better. You're the same person. If, if you want to be cultured, be cultured. If you want to be intelligent, be intelligent. Where you live doesn't make you better than people. But a lot of people that live on the coast tend to think that they're better simply because of, you know, where they live. And that's not true. And so, again, I mean, yeah, Colin Coward has done plenty to um, to uh, demonstrate that uh, he's, I mean, he's, he's done a good job with his career, right? So if you want to take pride in that, you know, if he wanted to look down his nose at me because... He's got a massive platform talking about sports, and I have a relatively small platform talking about sports. Fine. That's something that you've done and earned that is significantly better than what I've done and earned. But it, it really is annoying to me that a lot of people think that they have earned something because I'm a part of this group. And then, with that, they're going to use that fake thing that comes from nowhere to attack people for no reason who have done absolutely nothing wrong and who are not less than you, but for some reason you... Be, which, which I mean, it's such a really disgusting thing. I mean, it's honestly, and I'm not saying it's as bad, but it comes from the same formula as people who are, let's say, a part of supremacist organizations. It's the same thing. I feel weak and insecure. I'm going to join this group that says, our group is better than every other group. We are the best group. And just by virtue of you being here, that makes you more powerful. It makes you superior to everyone else. And then you use that to turn around and say, I'm better than you. I am of the supreme group, and you are of the lesser group. You can say one is better than the other, but it's the same attitude. You have the same desires as those people have. I feel small and insignificant, so I'm going to go join this group that I think is better. And just by virtue of me uh, uh, bending the knee... And giving my allegiance to this group, that makes me a better person or, or a more powerful and supreme person. And I get to use that supremacy to turn around and crap on all these other people that I, I already despise. And, and what is that? That's, that's you're a small, insecure person filled with hatred. And to sit on a television show as a small, insignificant person filled with hatred of people based on who they are, which is bigotry. It's, it's, again, it's the exact same thing where racism and sexism and all the other isms come from. It's the same thing. It's, I'm going to collectively hate a group of people because of something that is benign. All of them are just subsets of bigotry. And it's not better. It's not. It's the same thing. It's bigotry and supremacy. And I'm doing it to further perpetuate the idea that I am a part of the elite class, which, of course, you are not. It's all make-believe. And again, when you actually look at the content and the conduct, you realize there's absolutely nothing superior about Colin Coward. There isn't. I mean, he's put in a lot of work, but the work isn't... And, and this is where a lot of people go wrong. I mean, there are some unbelievably talented people that do incredible work that are never going to make it. I, I shouldn't have said it that way because I want to name somebody, but, you know, I, I shouldn't say he's never going to make it. He, he might. He's a guy that I've worked with in the past. He works harder than anybody I know. He's putting out these articles that are so unbelievably in-depth that I, I mean... <sighs> I, I have it open. It's, it's, it's a three-part series, and I want to open it, and I'm going to have the robot help me break it down, and it's all this, like, in-depth freaking stats and how it's intertwined with this book on, like, nature and evolution and how that compares with the football and evolution and all these things. It's like, oh, my good Lord. And he, you know, 
it's Mark Jarvis. He has put in more work than anybody I know to try to make it in this NFL draft industry. He has started his own uh, Jarvis scouting um, business, which I hope is doing well. Hopefully he's got a ton of clients and everything's going well. I don't know. But the point is, he's not getting the recognition. Like, a lot of people in the industry know who he is, and they're like, oh yeah, he's, re- he's really intelligent, and we respect the work that he puts in. But the difference between Mark and a lot of the people that are really making it and climbing through the ranks is that Mark is focusing on being the absolute best that he can be and doing the best possible job that he can do. He cares about the quality of the work. He cares about being a better scout. The people that climb the ranks, they care about climbing the ranks. You get what you put into it, right? If, if, you're, if your goal is to you know, cuddle up with major networks, to make inroads with other hosts, with other podcasts, with other bigger shows, and you, you just slowly worm your way up, that's what you get. And that's why you get these shows that we get with such low quality. Because the people at the top are the people that put in the work to be at the top, not necessarily the people that put in the work to do the best work. And that's part of the reason I like podcasts and YouTube and all that kind of stuff, because there, it kind of bridges the gap a little bit. Again, you get the guy like Brett Coleman. He basically just put a YouTube ch- channel together and said, I'm going to focus on on putting together great content. And people that like that flock there. And that's great. But for a lot of people, there is that disparity. And I think Colin Coward falls into the other category. His job is to figure out how to be at the top of the industry. And that comes with a lot of things um, that don't involve being the most knowledgeable person in sports. Because he's not. I mean, th- listen, they're, they're, th- his consumer base, some of these people that watch sports, man, it's insane the knowledge that they have. Any of these guys has more knowledge and insight and, and, and whatnot. I mean, I mean there, there are thousands of people that know more than Colin Coward does, but they're never going to sit in his seat. And honestly, I think the condescension to middle America and placating certain groups over other groups is exactly why he's in that seat. Because he understands it's not about the quality. It's about making your bosses happy. It's about making relationships. It's about appealing to certain people, even if that means denigrating others. So... That's why he is and will be successful. His job isn't to make you happy. His job is to make his boss happy. And you would think that that's a one-to-one relationship, but it isn't. This is also why these shows are getting more and more ridiculous. Because, unfortunately, for a lot of the people that uh, apparently watch these shows, they don't want the content. They want people watching craziness, right? It's, it's, it's the whole purple elephant thing in, in advertising. Keep people's eyes glued to the television, even if, even if it's because they hate you. That's the only thing that matters. Dance around like a circus clown to get more attention. We need to go viral on social media, et cetera, et cetera. And again, that's why I, I, I have said in the past, you're, you're going to find better content listening to shows like this, and it's not to, to brag, this or a dozen other Packers podcasts. If you want to learn about the Bears, go listen to the guys on the ground covering the Bears. The national guys have no idea what the heck they're talking about. Find the podcasters and the YouTubers that dedicate their time to this. If you want to learn about the draft, I mean, the, the draft is a little different. A lot of the guys at the top are actually really talented as far as, the, you know, like, uh, I don't know, I can't think of their names, but yeah, the, the, the draft seems to be one of the few industries where, although there's a bunch of clowns clowning, the same clowns continue to clown. They don't know what they're doing, but it, it does seem to appreciate the people that are really good at what they do. So it's another good thing about the draft, I guess. Anyways, I'm, I'm freaking rambling again. Hey, Ryan, see you again in laugh again. Hey. Call him back because uh, I'm answering Seth's question. And by the way, I would like that information to figure out how to get on the little chat line stuff. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's really cool to sit and do the discussions here. I like it because then, you know, you get to hear other people's discussions. And sometimes other people talk about things that I'm like, oh, ooh, I never would have thought about that. And so then I get to jump in on it. But separate chat line works, too. That, you know, that way we're not cluttering up Packer time with us talking about other stuff that's not Packer related. Even though... We should get to do that occasionally, you know, down time of the year, keep the phone calls coming. Um, but, Seth, uh, yes, Alaska in the wintertime can be depressing. Um, a lot of people, they uh, go vacation anywhere from November through January. Those are going to be big vacation months to get out of Dodge and yeah. go somewhere else to do something, anything else, because that's the darkest time of the year. Um, there are some businesses up here that, you know, instead of tanning beds, they're just, like sunlight boosts, you go in and they, you know, give you some UV radiation with some vitamin D, help you, you know, produce vitamin D and all that good stuff. Um, help keep the moods up. Uh, personally, I, I don't mind it. I'm not a, I'm not a huge social butterfly to begin with. So if I, you know, if it's cold and, and windy and 
it's nasty outside, 40 below or something like that with the wind howling. I, I can sit inside my house for, you know, five or six days. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, projects, you always find little projects to do. That's the best time of year to do projects because in the summertime, you're really too busy making money and out doing work and trying to get things done outside while you have your summer month. So you do a lot of inside projects. Like I said, you uh, pick up hobbies. I make I make dream catchers out of caribou antlers. Um, so I put the web in it, and then I find a picture or an image inside that web, and then I use colored thread, and I wrap and bind and do a bunch of stuff to make that. Uh, I got, you know, house projects, you know, I got to paint and stuff like that. Other people do woodworking. Um, some people sew. There's people that do stuff on the computers. Uh, Community-wise, we get to be pretty, we try to stay relatively social. People look out for each other, so you do a lot more visiting in the wintertime. That's usually when we have our, our poker nights. Wintertime is a good time to have a once a week poker night, get together, play some cards. But, um, yeah, it can get down. In the cities, it's worse. I think Anchorage and Fairbanks are far, far worse because it's just the conditions are even crappier. <laughs> I'm out in the wilderness, so I can go play. You know, you hop on the snow machine or put some snowshoes on and on a decent day, go out and explore a little bit. It's pretty cool. So, but yeah, you know, it depends on the individual. But I'm out of time. We'll talk to you all later. Bye. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, in terms of, I mean, depending on what you can do, you know, I mean, some people you got to be outside. That's your job. Or even if, you know, you just have got your nine to five, you can't avoid it. One of the things I hated, <clears throat> this is when I worked in Kenosha, a, um, <clears throat> I worked down in uh, the basement of the hospital and there was no windows. And so you get there when, you know, when you leave, it's dark in wintertime. And so I didn't get to see the sun. And then I'd go down into the basement where there's no windows. And by the time I would leave in the afternoon, like four o'clock, it's dark again. So it's like, you know, granted, sometimes you go upstairs to work on some stuff and you can see a little bit of sunlight out the window. But like, I just, I never got to see it. And that really, really sucked. And, and again, you have to go outside. That was one of the years where it was like 50 below with the wind chill at one point. The freaking car won't start. You can't feel your fingers. Like your face is frozen. Like it just, it's like, come on, man. And you got to like shovel crap off your windshield all the time. Um, yeah, but I mean, if I, if I could just chill out in the house, maybe just run outside and see if I can get the grill going or something. I have to crank the temperature up to compensate, but you know, maybe force myself outside to go shovel or something. And that was really it. I, I could, I, it would be much less painful. That's for sure. Still sucks though. Hey, Ryan. Uh, Mike from San Antonio. Hey. Yeah, that brisket looked awesome, right? Mm-hmm. Got to convince the wife to uh, move back to Wisconsin. Open that barbecue truck. Yeah, man. Thought I'd just share that. Uh, who was it from Austin? Jersey, Jerry, Jersey Mike, I forget. Sandwich shop, dude, whatever. Yep. Uh, check out Moonshine in Austin. They got a nice sous vide steak. Yes. I know Ryan sous vide's right up your alley. Yes, sir. And, uh... Yeah, that's about it. Have a good one. Yeah, man, it's 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 uh sous vide steak is pretty pretty fantastic stuff. Um I mean sous vide you can do pretty much anything. I've I've done sous vide pork butts before and it's it's great because you get just the perfect tender consistency and there's there's no real evaporation from the from the uh you know, being smoked for hours. It's probably missing a little something something, but I I I'll well Two points on sous vide. As far as the the pulled pork goes, the one time I tried it, I tried it at a much lower temperature because you're supposed to do real high, but it's time and temperature for a lot of different things, not only uh, the safety of the food, but tenderness, right? Time will break things down. So I did, I forget what it was. It was it was low. It, was, it might've been 145 or might've been higher, 155 or something. And I put it in for a long time, 48, 72 hours, something. And it came out and I was a little upset because I don't think I put it in long enough. And it was still kind of tough. Like, I, I couldn't really shred it. I kind of could, but not really. However, it was the best tasting pork butt I've ever had, which makes sense because, you know, lower temperatures, things tend to taste a little better than higher temperatures. You just do the higher temperature because it, it tenderizes it so much. But I ended up kind of like half pulling, half chopping it. But man, that, that chopped pork butt, <laughs> you put some, some barbecue sauce on it, but you can still taste the pork coming through, which I'll be honest, I can't as much with a smoked pork butt. So, kind of interesting. Also, it got me thinking about the uh, the Al Pastor. 
Because you don't cook Alpest, it, it's a pork butt essentially, thin, thinly sliced, but you don't cook it up to 200 degrees. You cook it to like 145 like you would something else, but it's tender because it's marinated for a long time and stuff that marinates meat, and it's also thinly sliced in two directions, right? Thin, and then you slice it thin the other way. But anyways, as far as sous vide, cooks everything to a perfect end-to-end temperature. My favorite things, steaks are, are fantastic. Because again, you get a perfect whatever temperature you want it to be all the way end to end, and then you just flash sear it. Take some of the fun out of it, some of the sport out of it, and you're not going to get like as much smoke or charcoal flavor if that's the way you want to cook it. But if you're doing indoors and searing it on a cast iron, it's, it's perfect. Burgers are unbelievable for the same reason, same process. You can make a freaking five pound cheeseburger and it's a perfect medium, medium rare, whatever you want it to be from end to end, and then just sear it on the end. It's just so good. And then chicken. Chicken is the number one thing. I cook it well below the recommended 165. I forget exactly what it was. I used to do it all the time. I haven't done it in a long time, but I know that's going to freak some people out, but it is just soft and tender and delicious, and it's amazing. And again, you just sear it to kind of crisp it up, give it a little bit of extra stiffness, but oh my goodness, it's so good. No dryness anywhere. You can cut it with a fork. Sous vide is, is worth the investment. Hey, Ryan, Trevor, Virginia. Hey. Uh, um, I was moving. I'm like way behind on podcast. All good. I was in- Come back to us. Like, behind stuff. So. The anything I bring up is I've already discussed and stuff that we got to. Um, I apologize if you can see it, but I just want to get it out there uh, before um, I forget it all. But anyway, one of my calls came in choppy. I was just uh, I was just saying, basically, you know, most shows, if you call in, if they have a calling component, they're going to take, like, one or two calls. So you call 100 times and never even get on the air oh. um, with your show. You call, there's a 95% chance your call makes it on the air, if not better. So, um, just really appreciate it. You know, you, you, you put in a lot of work for this, I know, and, uh, just appreciate it. Um, so moving on, you know, I am, I am head of the Roger Goodell, like, get rid of him club. Yeah. Um, but I think he gives a little bit of flack and stuff, like, with these rule changes, because, first of all, Goodell is selected by the owners. 75% of the owners have to select, which is 24 out of 32. That's a lot of owners. So these owners are keeping around. Right. And same with the new touchback rule. Um, 24 out of 32 teams have to right. approve it. What are, like, who are these owners that are approving this? Like, I know the Packers, Mark Murphy voted against it. By the way, the, the, for everybody that's the pro-owner group, this is your owners that are doing this. And you know why they're doing it? For money. It's all about money. The owners don't give a crap about anything but money. And the same way they run their garbage organizations, where they focus on drafting people that are going to put butts in seats to put money in their pockets, as opposed to how do we build a long-term vision for a, for a team to become a great franchise, um, these are the same people who are deciding to keep Goodell. And, and again, what is Goodell's focus? His focus isn't on making the product better. It's about putting money in the hands of, first of all, the NFL, and second of all, the teams. Why? Because the, then they will... It's, it's this little insular bubble, this little feedback loop, where Goodell makes them money, and then they vote him in. And then Goodell makes them money, and then they vote to keep him in. It's the same thing. And so when these things come up, what are they going to... Anything that they vote on that is going to make sure that they either make money or protect their pocketbooks, they're going to vote on that. That's why things aren't going to get better, because of these freaking owners. And everybody thinks the Packers need an owner. No, the Packers don't need an owner. In fact, we need less owners. I don't know how we get away from ownership. I don't think that that's possible, because these guys own it, and they're going to sell it to somebody. And who are they going to sell it to? They're going to sell it to somebody that's willing to pay for it. And who's going to pay for it? Somebody that's willing to invest in it, knowing that there's a really good return on their investment. And until you start getting owners that, are, that stop being so freaking short-sighted, who are focused on how can I maximize money today, and instead saying, how can I make sure that this sport continues on for the next several generations so that when I pass this down to my kids and grandkids, because of course that's what they're going to do. That's what many of them have done already. It's why we have so many inept owners, because the freaking granddaughter of somebody who started a, I don't know why I sound like it's from New York there, the granddaughter of somebody who started a football team is now running a football team. Like, good Lord. Yes, I'm making fun of the Bears. But it's, it's just, it's all stupidity. It, it's not, again, it's, it's very similar to the Colin Coward thing. You would think that the point is, how do we do the best possible job to put out the best possible product? But it's not. There are a lot of other motivations. And as long as the motivation is, how do we make more money? Sometimes, hey, listen, adding more games to the season, I know a lot of people piss and moan about that, including the players. 
I'm not going to piss and moan about more football ever. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> I will be happy when at one point this is a full year-round sport. And I don't mean actually playing it, but you've got, you know, an extended season, which leads to an extended postseason, which leads to a much later Super Bowl. Then you push everything else back so that the draft is in like June or July. And then August, we're kicking things back off again. You put it in June, and then July, you got your mini camps and your training camps, and then you're right back at it. Just boom, 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 boom. Never let it stop, man. But again, it's it's not a one-to-one in terms of owners doing the best things and getting the best product. I've said this about GMs, too. You always assume, like, if you want to stay a GM, you better create a good team. So obviously, there's no conflict of interest here. No, their motivation isn't necessarily to create the best team. Their motivation is to keep their job. And if there's at any point a way to do that, they're going to do that. For example, if I can appease my owner, my boss, I'm going to do that. Also, that's also why they tend to be much more short-sighted, because they understand if I try to unravel a more long-term strategy, and in two years, we are a bottom five team over the next two years, there's a good chance I'm going to get fired, even though this is all a part of the longer-term plan. So that's why we have so much freaking mediocrity for such a long time. By the way, that's also why I have much more confidence in the Packers. Because everybody's looking at it and saying, you guys are headed to the absolute dark era. I think, I could be wrong about this, I really think it's unlikely we see the Packers that low. I just don't think that that's a thing. Because I think the bottom of the bottom of the bottom is reserved for the most inept organizations. People that are competent and know how to run a team, they'll go through dark patches. And, and by dark, I mean like, you know, missing the playoffs, possibly losing seasons, things of that nature. You go through that. But you usually don't completely bottom out, and you usually bounce back a lot quicker. The teams that stay perpetually garbage, the Browns, the Jets, the whatevers, it's because of horrible ownership terrible terrible ownership that doesn't know what in the world they're doing the detroit lions that is just pure ineptitude most i mean you could have had the fans vote on what to do as far as free agency and the draft over the last 20 30 40 years and probably could have had a similar if not better result than what you got in detroit same goes for chicago it is a poorly run organization and that isn't even necessarily to knock the the GMs and owners and all that stuff, but or uh, the GMs and coaches, but it's the way that the organization is run. It's run by people that have no idea what they're doing. They don't know what they're looking for, and they and, and they're constantly they're hiring the wrong people, and then they're interfering in areas that they shouldn't. The Green Bay Packers are an organization that is built with one purpose, and that is to put together a great football team. There is no ulterior motive. Now, you can have GM Brian Gutekunst saying, I'm going to plan on a more short-term strategy, but you have a culture in Green Bay that, again, as long as we continue the tradition of draft and develop, there's, there's only so far down the path you can go. The only real negative that you can have is if you have a GM that's not good at drafting and, and not really good at, at acquiring talent, and we hold on to them too long. And then it becomes a matter of trying to find that right GM. But the point is, it's a process. And as I've said before, it, it, it really has a lot less to do with the, the GMs and the coaches and all that stuff as we, as we tend to think. It's an important piece. But as long as you follow the formula, everything will be okay. It might not be as good as it was in the heyday with, with MVP Aaron Rodgers, right? That's a special thing. And there's no, there's no formula for finding the next Aaron Rodgers. There just isn't. I mean, there, there's, there, there are ways to optimize that process, one of which is draft too often and too early like we did with Jordan Love, even though everybody wants to piss and moan about it. That's how you go about finding that guy. Keep taking swings at the guy. But I, I just don't see a situation where, unless we get away from, from the Ron Wolf way of running the Green Bay Packers, which a lot of fans want to get away from, they want to be the Browns and just swing wildly and get all the early great picks and just get all the exciting stuff. Get all the big name players. That's what the teams at the bottom constantly do. Anyways, I am going to leave it at that. You guys have a good rest of your night. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.